Welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar hosted by the Organization Development and Change and Workforce Education and Development Program at Penn State. Today, we have the great pleasure of welcoming our presenter, Dr. John Dolan and Dr. Angela Stopper. My name is Jenny Lee, and I am a PhD candidate in the Workforce Education and Development Program. We also have Sagun Giri with us today, who will be managing chat feature and Q&A session. In terms of the interactive format for this webinar, please open the feature in the Zoom platform to interact. If you have any questions about the presentation, please use Q&A feature on Zoom. You can see the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Click the Q&A button and write your question. The Q&A session will be at the end of the presentation. Our online Master of Professional Studies in Organization Development and Change can help you prepare to implement quality and continuous improvement initiatives in an organization. Furthermore, there is a PhD program in Workforce Education and Development with a concentration in Human Resource Development and Organization Development. Our program has created a continuous monthly webinar series with experts around the world. Today, we have two presenters, Dr. Dolan and Dr. Stopper. Dr. John Dolan is an administrator at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy and co-teaches the class Marketing Organization Development. He earned his PhD in Organization Development from Penn State and his MBA in Marketing from the Owen Graduate School of Management at Vanderbilt University. He has been teaching at the graduate and undergraduate level on the topics of marketing, sales, and public relations for almost 12 years. Dr. Angela Stopper is the Chief Learning Officer at the University of California, Berkeley, and co-teaches the class marketing OD. She's a 2013 graduate of Penn State Workforce Education and Development Program and has a number of publications as speaking credits to her name. Here are Dr. Dolan and Dr. Stopper. Hi, everybody. I'm John Dolan. Um, I've got my grad assistant, uh, Hazel, behind me here. As you can see, she, you might see her uh, walking around a little bit during our presentation. Um, thanks for being with us today. We're here to speak with you about marketing organization development. Um, we'd like to welcome our current students, prospective students, and graduates of the program, as well as those of you joining us from industry. We've only got about an hour, uh, so we're going to jump right in and we'll start by doing some quick self introductions. Jenny gave you a little bit of background on us, but we'll expound on that a little bit. Again, I'm John Dolan, uh, Dr. John Dolan. I co teach Workforce Ed 881, Marketing Organization Development with Dr. Angela Stopper. I'm a 2013 graduate of the program. And in addition to my work in organization development and continuing in executive education over the years, I've spent almost 20 years teaching marketing, sales, and public relations at both the undergraduate and graduate levels uh, at Penn State. I've worked for a number of years in the private sector in marketing and sales roles at such companies as the Washington Post, Knight Ritter, Bell South, and AT&T. And as Jenny said, I earned my MBA uh, at the Owen Graduate School of Management at Vanderbilt University. I made a switch into higher ed and I've been working for a number of years as an administrator uh, for institutions such as Penn State. Uh, George Washington University and now Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where I am right now, um, where I oversee executive education at the McCourt School of Public Policy. You're on mute, Ange. <laughs> Thank you so much, my friend. <laughs> um, my name is Dr. Angela Stopper, and I co-teach Workforce 881, Marketing Organization Development with Dr. Dolan. I am also a 2013 graduate of the program and have spent my 20 plus career working in different areas of organization development. I've worked as both an internal and external talent development professional and consultant globally and with public and private institutions. Some of my past clients include Aramark, ExxonMobil, and the United States Department of Defense. I've done consulting in the United States, China, Saudi Arabia, as well as leadership development and executive education here in the US, in Europe and in South America. And currently, as Jenny said, I'm the chief learning officer for UC Berkeley. Uh, in that role, my team acts as internal consultants for our organization in all things people development and organization development. And trend analysis and marketing has always been a cornerstone of my career. 
even in this current internally focused role, we need to pay attention to marketing. marketing. You know, every day I think about how can we market ourselves and our services to remain relevant and impactful for our clients uh, on campus. And so today, Dr. Dolan and I are here to share with you what our over 40 years of combined marketing experience have taught us. We hope to accomplish three main things. We want to discuss a strategic framework for trend analysis. And using that framework, we wanna share 10 trends that we found that may impact organization development in 2021, and then discuss what we can do to leverage opportunities related to each of those trends. So we'll start by sharing with you a framework that you can use as a strategic leader in this space to learn from your environment and build a trend analysis that will help make you successful. Now on this slide, you'll see a model that we use when we were getting ready for this webinar. This is a strategic leadership model that can be used for trend analysis of this type. Um, you'll see it's a five-step model and it was created by a Penn State professor and, and a mentor of mine, Dr. Albert Basiri. As you look at the model, you'll see kind of five steps, look out, look around, look in the mirror, look to the team, and then look for results. Research has shown that leaders often start a trend analysis by looking internally at their organization. And what this model forces us to do is to start outside and then move inside. We start by looking out, gaining understanding around industry patterns and discovering the stories that they tell. The most important thing to keep in mind in this step is to not miss those patterns. You need to look to your environment and see the story. You need to see the connections upstream and downstream. You need to be able to think creatively and extrapolate what the world means to you and for you. And then you look around. You look for growth and success. What are the most successful in your space look like? What are they doing? And only then do you look internally, you look in the mirror, you see where you fit into the mix and it can impact the future with the knowledge you now possess. The role of a 21st century leader is really about getting results and building commitment. As Dr. Vasiri always says, being a boundaryless thinker, a network builder, a diplomat, and an interpreter. And that's when you look to your team and you look for results. If you wish to learn more, you can visit Dr. Vasiri's website, which is on the slide here, or YouTube, and see a lot of videos of Dr. Vasiri talking about this model and additional resources that he has in this space related to strategic leadership, strategic thinking, trend analysis, and that kind of work. And with that, let's quickly walk through what we found out when we looked out, around, and in the mirror. To start the discussion, I'm gonna yield the floor to Dr. Dolan. All right, thank you, Dr. Stopper. So as we look out, we wanted to first determine some general marketing trends. As we research and think about marketing trends in 2021, here are some of the things we noted. This isn't an exhaustive list by any stretch, um, but it's some things that we thought uh, were important to, uh, to focus on and bring to your attention. Some of these may be familiar to you and some maybe are not. Um, so this, this first one, user-generated content. That's content created by customers, employers, or employees, or partners, uh, influencers maybe, and other business stakeholders. And you don't pay for this uh, to be shared online. It's like free uh, publicity. Um, these days, the most uh, popular format of UGC is an Instagram image, um, but that format can also be text or tweets or videos or, or sound files too. These posts get the customer to know, like, and trust your brand. Next to branded content. Branded content is, is not meant to promote a specific product, but to address one of the issues that our world is currently facing, our society is facing today, such as um, you may be, remember a campaign uh, that Dove did around uh, beauty stereotypes, for example, or maybe gender inequality. Um, when used correctly, branded content should drive engagement increase brand awareness and improve brand loyalty to your, to your firm or your product. Next, social commerce. We've probably all done this and didn't realize that it had an actual name. Um, this is where the entire shopping experience from product discovery and research to actually the checkout process takes place right on the social media platform like Facebook. Brand activism. This consists of business efforts to promote or impede 
or direct social, political, economic, or maybe environmental policy with the desire to promote or impede improvements in our society. A study in 2020 found that 80% of brands in the Fortune 100 engaged in some sort of, of social brand activism, such as posting statements on social media regarding the Black Lives Matter initiative, for example. Google Core Web Vitals. This is a, a new set of metrics that are related to speed, responsiveness, and visual stability of your website. It's gonna have a big impact on search engine optimization and how you're ranked in uh, search results on Google. Nostalgia marketing, you've probably all seen this as well. This is when using themes from your past in your marketing in order to trigger some sort of emotional response. Um, and then that creates a positive association with your, your brand and your product or service. Going live. Virtual events. We've had a year of trial by fire and virtual engagements. Um, going back to in-person everything is probably unlikely. And so going live and figuring out how to use virtual events um, is going to be a key component for any marketing plan. A survey done by Integrate shows that 80% of businesses surveyed expect to run or participate in some sort of hybrid event. Um, so it's really important to plan out your video strategy for the upcoming year. According to Cisco, 82% of all internet traffic by 2022 will be consuming videos. So video is going to be really important. Streamlining social media presence, uh, presences. Um, organizations are figuring out which ones work, which ones are the most important, and which ones don't they need to be on. Um, those are all really important strategic decisions. You really need to think about where your audience is and what you hope to gain by participating in these social media platforms. There's no need to have a TikTok if that's not your audience. So keep that in mind. Brand to brand collaboration. As the saying goes, a rising tide floats all boats. And by collaborating with a complementary brand or service provider, your own business may prosper as a result. Um, and this is, this is not necessarily new. This has gone on for a long, long time, the collaboration with businesses, but most recent, um, some examples might be Sherwin-Williams Paints partnering with Pottery Barn, for example, or Starbucks partnering with Spotify to promote the music in their, um, in their, in their stores. Um, so it gives you an opportunity to think, is there a service or maybe another consultant that you can partner with and, and then market yourselves together for a mutual benefit? Increased impact of influencers. Unless you've been under a rock uh, for the past few years, you probably know an influencer, according to the Influencer Marketing Hub, is somebody who has the power to affect the purchasing decisions of others because of his or her, his or her authority, knowledge, position, or relationship with his or her audience, and they have a following in a distinct niche, and they actively engage with that niche as well. So the size of that following depends on the size of his or her topic of the niche. Um, clear state of the influencer marketing report states that influencer impact grew by 57% year over year, um, which is just astounding. And 73% of marketers are putting more resources towards influencer marketing than over last year. All right. So as we look to step two, looking around, we want to focus specifically on our industry, OD. What trends do we see in the workforce that will impact OD and how we need to market our services? And again, this is not exhaustive, but these are things that we thought would be helpful to focus on and bring to your attention. So the first one, Generation Z, Gen Z, entering the modern workforce. I remember when Gen X was the, was the uh, generation that was entering the modern workforce. That's a dating myself a little bit. Um, Gen Z now accounts for 20% of the US population. Um, their birth years between 1997 and 2005, if any of you fall into that uh, range, you are a Gen Zer. Um, and some of them are now firmly in their mid twenties and they are in the workforce. So they need to be uh, heard and accounted for. Remote work. With so many people having spent the last year working from home, will we ever return back to pre-pandemic work environment? And if so, what will that look like? An innate liking of flexible work schedules. And that's another probably result 
of the pandemic, um, where people aren't necessarily working the normal quote unquote business hours that they used to. Um, how will we adjust to that? Will we still adhere to those normal business hours for, um, it probably depends on the type of work and those would need to be uh, considered. The need for centralized communication, that's not new, uh, but that is certainly a priority um, in the coming year, um, certainly as we are all still working um, in a dispersed environment, centralized communication is going to be really, really key. The emphasis of work-life balance, again, that was something that was kind of always important, but even more so um, due to the pandemic. And it's certainly even a, a stronger driver for both millennials and Gen Z employees. So organizations will need to respond accordingly if they haven't done so already. Investing in employee well-being. Now, this is somewhat new. The events of the past year have left us all, if you're anything like me, incredibly stressed. Uh, a survey done by the American Psychology Association in 2020. Home life and their workload. Organizations are now offering up benefits around therapy and other holistic services in order to help their employees navigate this new reality. One organization even goes as far as to earmark 1% of employee salaries to fund these initiatives. That's something to think about. Focus on gender equality and equity. As has been reported, women have been disproportionately disadvantaged by the pandemic. Um, some research shows that 25% of women are now actively thinking about downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce entirely, uh, which would be an unfathomable loss. Employers can help turn this around by offering flexibility and creativity in terms of how work gets done and adjusting workplace norms and performance metrics to acknowledge the imbalance that the pandemic has created. Social purpose becomes a priority. We talked about that uh, already with uh, when activism and uh, social commerce. The gig economy continues to rise. These types of jobs are becoming the norm, not the exception, and employers will need to be more flexible and adaptable in order to accommodate their employees who rely on these side gigs to support their families. Upskilling. Upskilling is taking a, 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 a moment in the spotlight. We saw how the pandemic required organizations to train employees on the spot to develop new skills in order to keep their businesses going. This will only continue in 2021. Robots and humans in the workplace. Um, that sounds like uh, out of a science fiction novel. It is not. Um, this even has a name. The collaborative robot or cobot is one that is specifically des designed for human interaction, such as in service types of jobs, like maybe a bartender in a warehouse or delivery unit or, or cleaning, um, like a Roomba even at your, at your house. Um, so these is, this is not something that is uh, in the far future, it is here um, and needs to be thought about in terms of how to incorporate that into, the, into our workforce. And finally, a focus on soft skills. Um, Post-COVID qualities such as adaptability, creativity, and innovation will all be very key attributes for the workplace and, and uh, will need to be addressed. And with that as our foundation, we move to step three, looking in the mirror. What does this mean for us? And what do we know as OD professionals that we should consider as part of this analysis? Well, we can say without hesitation that first, no one has unlimited funds to spend on workforce and organization development. That's not new. <laughs> Uh, our clients, whether they're internal or external, need to manage development budgets without sacrificing innovation or impact. And finally, our clients also need to prioritize investments. And we need to create marketing messages with all of this in mind. I'll turn it back to Dr. Sato. So now that we uh, moved to, so now is when we move to like the thinking part of the model. As we consider what we just discussed, and all the other aspects that we might find as we look out around and in the mirror, what trends do we anticipate related to marketing, organization development services, and consulting in 2021? What can we look to our teams to act upon? What does this mean for us, for our teams, as we look for success in the future? 
So some of the ideas that we came to, and again, these are in no particular order, meaning that you know number one isn't more likely or more important than number 10. But after this analysis, here's some of the things that we came to. First, we wanna talk about that desire to create a healthy workplace. This will be critical for our clients. How can we use this trend to build our marketing plan for 2021 and beyond? Think about how you can help your clients build programs that create a healthy workplace and also how you as a consultant can build healthy workplace practices into your client interactions. We think that's gonna be really important. Also this increased interest in remote work. We feel that's something that our clients will ask for or that they will need our support with. And this isn't just because of the current pandemic. Talk of this started way before January, 2020, but the lasting power of this trend may be because of the pandemic. The last year has shown many companies that remote workers are successful workers. So again, think, how can we incorporate remote practices into our marketing? How can we incorporate this into our business practices that would make us the consultant of choice for our clients? Does our marketing prove that we can work successfully in a remote work environment? And can we help our clients implement practices that will make them successful employers of remote workers? Next, we wanna focus a little bit on that continued focus towards employee engagement. Particularly, how do we help clients engage a remote workforce and how do we ensure we are creating engaging, meaningful relationships with our clients as part of our marketing, as part of our outreach and as part of our client onboarding programs? Do you even have a client onboarding program? And will it work in this environment? All of these are really important questions to be asking yourself as you're creating your marketing strategy for, for the future. Next, talking about that need for customized sales experiences. As Dr. Dolan discussed, social commerce is a subset of electronic commerce that involves the online media and supports social interaction and user contributions to assist in buying and selling of services. So as people get more accustomed to social commerce and this customized shopping experience, we need to be sure we're thinking about that as part of our marketing plans. What's going to make you stand out as a provider of choice to clients who are used to this level of customization? Also marketing that's meaningful. As we think about brand activism, we need to ensure that the brand we are selling, which is most often ourselves as consultants, means something to our clients. We talk about this a lot in the OD space, but even more today, who you are is as important as what you can do. So building that personal brand in with your corporate brand really means something to clients. And you need to pay attention that, to that to make sure that you're matching the clients that you most wish to work with. And that leads right into our sixth trend, having a strong social media presence and brand. Social media is kind of the new word of mouth advertising, and it's beyond time to get on board and to build a presence that people can see and know. This isn't going away, so if you haven't gone, got on board, it's time to get on board. And if you did get on board a while ago, you need to check to ensure you're still making the strong, strong impact that you thought you were when you started your social media marketing journey. We also call out that we see clients demanding diversity in their consultants. The workforce push towards gender equality and overall equity is going to continue to strengthen and the need for consultants who can market themselves as having shared lived experiences with their clients or having connections to those who do that they can bring in to enhance the consulting engagement we think is going to be really, really important. This also means if you're a one person shop, you're going to need to have strong partnerships to call upon for help. Your clients are looking for diverse networks and connections. And in addition to having those varied solutions that will allow them to meet their employees where they are. So your ability to share the power and impact of your diverse network and to build diversity and multimodal solutions will be really important part of your marketing strategy. And that leads us to authenticity. So authenticity is becoming more and more important to customers when they choose a service provider being transparent in your communications so that your prospective customers can see that you are a real person and there's a real person behind your brand. 
understanding what's important to your target audience and being able to sincerely reflect that back to them in your marketing is critical. And finally, budget. In this day and age, and probably perpetually moving forward, budgets are going to be tight. And as we think about our marketing strategy, it's important to remember you need to talk about the full impact related to the OD intervention you're proposing. Tie your impacts to the business outcomes. Detail how, by partnering with you, the organization will benefit on multiple levels. And make the business case that every dollar of money and every minute of time invested will be worth it to your client organizations. So the final step of doing this kind of trend analysis is to think about now that I know, or I think I know this, what do I need to do to set up metrics and measures? Remember the old saying, what, get me what gets measured is what gets done and what gets rewarded is what gets repeated. In our course, Dr. Nolan and I use the words actionable and measurable a lot. Mm -hmm. In marketing, we need to ensure that our plans are actionable so, so we know what to do and measurable so we know how to hold ourselves accountable for doing what we say we're going to do. So to, the, to do this, you know, as it relates to trend analysis, we always like to start by thinking of a quote from Arthur Ashe. If you don't know the story of Arthur Ashe, I strongly recommend you check it out. He's a very inspirational figure who overcame unbelievable difficulty and diversity in his personal and professional life. And when asked how he did this, this is what he said. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. So to, to that end, starting where you are and using what you know, let's discuss what you can do. So, <clears throat> As you saw, the final critical aspect in strategic leadership is, is committing to action. Once you've decided on your strategies and goals, as we've discussed again, hammering home, something that's actionable and measurable, you need to implement it. You need to put it into, into play. As you remember, that construct around strategic leadership includes a segment about looking for results, putting your plan into action. In many cases, that means setting your team loose to make it so. But a lot of us don't have a team. Many OD professionals are sole proprietors and that team actually is probably just you. <laughs> so putting a plan into action can be especially daunting for a sole proprietor or an individual, um, especially if you're new, if you're a new entrepreneur who may not uh, be 100% confident in their abilities. We, we uh, get this a lot. Uh, in our course where students who are thinking about becoming an OD consultant and are thinking about how to market themselves, how to market themselves, there's a lot of hesitation there um, to sort of put themselves out there and to market themselves as, as an expert um, and really trusting in their abilities. Uh, so that's a, that's a big hurdle. That said, this is the time to focus on your results, on those goals that you painstakingly put into place and commit to the steps to achieve them. And as I said, that's not always easy. I think I liken it often to starting a diet or an exercise regimen. I'll start my diet on Monday. I'll make those cold calls on Monday. Um, it's, it's very easy to put it off. It's not at all unusual to experience also paralysis by analysis. Uh, you've probably heard that term, feeling like you're not ready to start because you don't have quite enough information about the market or you haven't explored absolutely every avenue that you can. So I had a boss once who told me, don't let perfect get in the way of good. Maybe you've heard that phrase uh, before. I learned that it was not his original idea um, as I was preparing for this webinar, uh, but is in fact attributed to French philosopher Voltaire. Um, from over 250 years ago. So it's an adage that has literally stood the test of time, which makes it all the more valuable. And basically I've included this to say, don't be afraid to get started. Stick to your plan, even when it becomes hard, or even when you don't feel like it. Um, that doesn't mean that goals can't be amended or modified. In fact, good marketing strategy needs to be nimble and adaptable. If you have created a goal that after sort of putting things into play is uh, out of reach, change it. But the only way you're gonna know if these goals require amendment or modification 
is if you begin the work to achieve them in the first place and compare those results to the goals that you've set. So as we think about the trends that we've outlined, we want you to think about what action you will commit to uh, taking to make sure you're ready for an incredible 2021 and beyond. How can you link your results to what you just heard or what you discover? When you start where you are, use what you have and do what you can after looking out, around and in the mirror. And with that, that concludes our uh, content and we'd be happy to open it up uh, for questions. Uh, hi, so we have a couple of questions here. I'll uh, read through them. So we have a first, uh, first we have a question from Gretchen Hover. Uh, she says, hi, Dr. Dolan, are you noticing any difference in trends between B2C and B2B markets? That's a great question, Gretchen. And Dr. Stopper, I'll encourage you to hop in on this as well. Um, you know, I think always there's always going to be differences between B2C and B2B uh, approaches to marketing. And, and I think as you look at some of the trends that we identified, some of them are going to lend themselves better to B2B and B2C and vice versa. So I think what's important here is to think about how each of these trends is going to impact you, depending on what uh, sort of what space you're working in. Um, and we can all learn a lot, I think, whether we're in a B2C, we can learn a lot about um, from what's going on in the B2B space and vice versa. So I think that that's, uh, it's important to take a look at what's going on in, in both spaces. Yeah, and I think that's why this model that we use to do our trend analysis is, is so powerful because it forces us to do those big picture lookouts and to kind of get that sense of the full landscape so that you can start to narrow that down into kind of match what your client profile is. But I still think it's important to look very broadly at what's just happening out in the world, B2B, B2C, so you can start to infer um, what that might mean for you in the space that you work in. Um, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Aura Querjao. She asks, uh, how can small businesses drive innovation without overstretching their budgets? What are some ways that you suggest? Thank you for the webinar. Yeah, I, I can start and then I'll flip it over to Dr. Dolan. You know, we talk about this a lot. As a matter of fact, one of our um, achievement criteria for our performance evaluation at UC Berkeley that we've brought into, uh, into existence over the last year or so, one of our achievement criteria is innovation. And, and when you think about innovation, I think there's a couple ways you can think about it. Some people hear the word innovation and they think uh, inventing the next light bulb or, you know, in Berkeley's case, having the next Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, or inventing the next CRISPR technology. What we try to focus on when we think about innovation in mass is, um, you know, continual change, continual improvement. So the, those pieces of innovation that aren't, you know, huge, but that they're very attainable for people. And I think defining innovation in that way is, is really, really important as you're looking at small businesses. You know, being able to say innovation is finding workforce efficiencies and effectiveness, that's innovative. And so being able to look at those, those little tweaks that you can make, those little pivots that you can make or help your clients make to make them more effective, more efficient, more practical, more suited for success in the world moving forward is innovation. And I think just working with people to build that vocabulary and, and build that vision of what innovation truly is, you know, it's not this lone genius kind of concept of innovation, even in some of the greatest innovation shops, they talk about the think do model. And so being able to make the $5 experiment, do and do something with it, see if it works. That form of innovation, I think, is really, really powerful for all organizations, including, including small businesses. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and I think something to think about, you know, it's even with organizations like, like mine at Georgetown University, I, I have a woefully small <laughs> marketing budget. Um, and so, and I, I don't know if that's the case for you too, Dr. Stopper, but uh, um, it, it, 
so it requires a lot of creativity about how to stretch uh, small budgets and achieve your goals. I think this is where social media really plays a big role in helping you um, expand your footprint and get your voice out there. Um, it, it does allow you just, you know, through your own labor, um, an opportunity to, uh, to position yourself as um, an expert with something to say. And so, you know, creating short videos, um, putting yourself out there as a subject matter expert in, in LinkedIn, for example, um, joining uh, virtual groups uh, for professionals where you can start to network and, um, and kind of open those doors that will uh, establish yourself as a resource um, that can help lead to uh, business down the road. Those are really important um, skills and tactics to take when you have uh, not a lot of money. Uh, thank you. So uh, Chris asks, thoughts on how to bridge the division growing between the workers who have to be on site mm -hmm. and the workers who can remotely work within an organization? Yeah, that's a that's a something where I think most of us are facing. Uh, I know we are at uh, at my institution where we do have some of our staff that is um, you know that is back on campus. I clearly am not. <laughs> um, as you can see with my dog uh, hanging out behind me in my couch. Um, and so I think that I'd, I'm, I'm proud to say that, that my school, the McCourt School of Public Policy, um, has done a really good job in kind of bridging that gap between, um, between those who are on site and those who are not and keeping everybody engaged. Uh, and uh, we're all working towards the same goals. I mean, we were, we were very deliberate about creating opportunities for engagement uh, for all employees, whether they're working uh, remotely or in person, um, and trying to uh, find ways that we can uh, sort of recreate the vibe that we had a year ago when we were all uh, in the same place together. It's not easy to do, and it does require some really deliberate um, uh, engagement. Um, but I think it's very, very, very important as we're seeing, uh, you know, the um, one of the outcomes of this pandemic is people that are working virtually feel very isolated. Um, and the same can be true uh, for those in, in our case who are working in an almost empty campus uh, and, and may not see uh, um, people, you know, with, with any regularity. So um, think about ways, even if it's you know, virtual coffee hour, we do that a couple times a month in our group uh, to allow people the opportunity to engage uh, with one another like they would have in the hallway or in the break room. Um, uh, we do uh, weekly trivia, um, which is another great way to, to stay engaged. Uh, so things like that, I think are really important. They may sound a little hokey, uh, but I think that it, it's, it's an important um, strategy to take to make sure that both sides feel like they are um, they are being acknowledged and they're being made to know that what they're doing, uh, no matter where they're working, has value and um, that they need to continue to be engaged. And that's another thing to think about as well. Our, our faculty members are facing this as hybrid courses are ramping up. Um, where they have some students that are um, virtual and some in the classroom. So they need to be able to do that sort of in the moment uh, and, and keep that engagement going. It's not, not an easy skill. Yeah, I, I second everything that Dr. Dolan just said and, and wanna, wanna say, you know, one of the very important things that, that we've seen because we have a very similar situation, one of the very important things that I, that I ask you all to think about is make sure you have a really strong answer to the question, why? Why does person A need to be in the office and person B need to be working from home? And not only figuring out what your why is, but communicating that. You know, I think so many times we, we talk about these things when we're in leadership roles and, you know, I meet with my leadership team twice a week. We spend about three hours a week together talking about all these things. And, and we forget that maybe not everybody, particularly not our frontline workers are as entrenched in, in these discussions as we are. And, and they're not even knowing that we're talking about this and we're, we're thinking strategically about who needs to be where and why they need to be there. 
And just sharing some of that why can be really powerful because it allows people to feel that engagement as Dr. Dolan was talking about. It helps them see their connection to the, to the overall mission and, and vision. And it also allows you to ensure that, that your why is a strong why. You know, you, you need to make sure that if you're, you're building these structures where you have folks that, that do need to be in, in the space and you have folks that are able to work, be able to work from home, you need to make sure that you're making those, those decisions with strategic purpose and that they make sense. And then a second point I, I might ask you to, after you figure out why and communicate that, ask people what they need. It's incredible how often we in, in senior leader positions try to figure out, well, if we just do this, or if we just make this step, or if we just you know, do this program, or you know, people are gonna feel like they're engaged. Without actually doing that kind of looking out and looking around and asking them just within our own organizations, how are you feeling? You know, how, 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 what would make you feel better? We've implemented a pulse survey system now at Berkeley and it's, it's truly a pulse survey. It's five to seven questions. It takes people about 30 seconds to do it. And we're pushing it out every six weeks and we're asking people questions like, how are you feeling? Does your supervisor care about your well being? You know, really simple questions like that. So we're gathering a ton of data to allow us to build programs that will really help with that engagement for everybody in the workforce, wherever it is that they're working, working from. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from uh, Nevin. Um, is there room for cold calling in one's marketing mix? <laughs> um, I know my answer, Dr. Stopper. You uh, I, I'm yes. Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a that's a one word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, and it is it, it's not fun. Um, yeah. If anyone has has ever done it, it's it's not fun, but it can be made less painful. I will definitely say that if you do it the right way. Um, and we talk we talk a lot about this in our in our course. Um, in, in creating value in in uh, for the person that you are engaging with. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly one of the things that social media has made really helped me made easier is that it's um, it's a lot easier to find a connection to somebody than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not really as cold um, as, it, as it used to be before uh, sources like LinkedIn were, were around. Um, so you can almost always find a connection to an industry or someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone um, that that makes that just a little bit uh, of a warmer um, contact. But beyond that, um, you know, having some value for the person that you're reaching out to um, and positioning it so that it's not about what you want, but about what you can do to help them um, and what they can uh, what they can get out of it. Um, so I would say it is a absolutely a, a component of uh, marketing strategy. Yeah, I agree. And, and as Dr. Dolan said, finding ways to make those cold calls a little bit warmer. Um, you know, the, the day of, I don't know that anybody ever did this, but flipping open the, the phone book and just starting to call phone numbers, you know, those kind of cold calls I think have, have thankfully found yes. their end. Um, but you know, well, I, will, example, I, will, I will hop in there and tell you, I had a boss once when I was in uh, ad sales at the Washington Post um, years and years and years ago, if you were uh, if you were supposed to be an outside salesperson out calling on your clients, if you were spending too much time in the office, according to our boss, he would bring out the big yellow paper <laughs> and, as a threat and threaten to drop it in your desk and make you cold call uh, using just what you were talking about. Right. <laughs> the, the ice cold, ice cold call. You know, that everybody scoot real quick. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, to, to Dr. Dolan's point, like find ways to make it a little bit warmer, find ways to make it more valuable. You know, I got a, the new cold call maybe of the, the era are the cold emails. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure uh, you all get emails in your inbox and you at least maybe glance at them. So I work at Berkeley, which is spelled B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y. I got an email 
a couple of weeks ago from somebody who was just gushing over the amazing work that I've done at B-E-R-K-L-E-Y. Uh. Um, yeah, which was just another way to spell Berkeley. It's just not the way that we spell it <laughs> at the number one public institution in the world. And, and then this morning, right before the call, I log into my email and I got a second email where they, they took their previous email and forwarded it and said, hey, Dr. Stopper, thoughts, question mark? And it just, you know, just makes you chuckle. It's like, uh -huh. no, I'm <laughs> not, no, I have no thoughts for you. Maybe get a spell checker. Or, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Angela Michelle Rogers asks, uh, any tips for breaking out of paralysis by analysis? Uh, hi, Angela Rogers. I know you. I know you. Hey, Angela. <laughs> um, so that's tough. And I, and I, and I do think that that does require some some sort of mindset shifting and and just taking a deep breath and and letting it go. Um, from my perspective, I think that's the best way to do it. You're never going to have all the information that you think you need. You just never will. Um, and so coming to that understanding and figuring out what that the sort of sweet spot is um, you certainly want to have enough information that you feel informed about the market, for example, and informed about the competitive space um, to, an, to a degree uh, so that you can make uh, prudent decisions. Um, but understanding that you will never have it all um, and uh, is an important um, uh, sort of realization to have. And those of us who are pursuing our, who pursued our PhDs, you know, we can say the same thing. Like you, there's always probably another source that you didn't find for your lit review, but eventually you just have to move on. You have to do it. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary evil. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's uncomfortable. It is. And I think adding to that, if you are a leader and you're leading a team or, you know, just for yourself, you know, being okay with trying something and, and maybe it not working out exactly. Uh, so, you know, being okay to fail, building a culture of being okay to fail because you know you can pivot. You know, that word is, is I use it probably far too much. Like I, I will tell people on my team, like, you know what? This is 85% there. Let's throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. And if it doesn't, we're going to pivot because we're going to be checking in with our clients. We're going to be checking in with our customers. We're going to be talking to our leadership. And we can always make adjustments. And I think sometimes, particularly when you work in, in um, kind of high-performing organizations, we call ourselves recovering perfectionists. You know, you, you want this space where you can make the beautiful present with the perfect wrap and the beautiful bow on top. And then that's what you wanna to present to the world because you know that there's somebody out there waiting to like shoot holes in whatever it is that you put forward. You know, you know in my case, the, the San Francisco Chronicle is just waiting for Berkeley to do something stupid so they can write about us doing something stupid. And, and so we have to be okay with getting to the point where it's not going to be the perfect wrap with the perfect bow because the world is just moving so fast and change is happening so fast that that perfection, it just doesn't happen. You know, there's a, there's a saying that a colleague of mine, Lasana Hotep, who's an expert in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, shared with me a couple of weeks ago, and it was something to the effect of, you know, if you don't pay attention to the, to the movement you're making, you may just end up where you thought you were going to end up. And the reason why that's scary is because, you know, where you thought you wanted to be a year ago is not probably where you need to be now. Like, do you all remember when the, the pandemic started? I remember for me, it was the, the day before St. Patrick's Day. So March, they sent us all home from campus. I came home and I said to my husband, oh my goodness, what if we're still in this lockdown at my birthday, which is May? And both of us were like, how will we possibly function if we're still, I mean, yeah. May is like come and gone what, yes. a thousand times over <laughs> and here we are and it's fine and it's good and we're doing great things and we're making great things happen. But, you know, that ability to pivot, I think, or, you know, if you don't like the word pivot, you can use a thousand different words for that is really critical when you're thinking about getting out of 
that analysis paralysis and maybe becoming a recovered perfectionist as well. Thank you. Uh, Karin, uh, Corinne Tomasini asks, um, she says, uh, thank you very much for, those, for this webinar. Are the OD trends that you mentioned mainly US related or do you expect them in Europe too? Um, go ahead. Um, you know, I think we focused mo mostly on US sources yeah. for this presentation, okay. uh, but I think a lot of them, because the world is getting smaller every yeah. day, and we're, we're all facing a lot of very, very similar challenges. I think a lot of them are probably transferable, yeah. but you're, that is a good, that's good insight. Thank you, Corinne, for pointing that out. We definitely, I think, had a, a US lens on it when we were preparing. Yeah, we did. Thank you. Um, Manar asks, how, um, how does COVID-19 affect the trends today? Well, I, yeah, I think that we kind of addressed a lot of some of that in, um, in the trends and some of them are trends because of COVID. Uh, because of COVID. So as we're talking about remote work, for example, um, uh, and, uh, and, and training and um, upskilling, uh, you know, those sorts of things I think are, are, have become trends because of the pandemic. Um, but I think that uh, we're seeing that um, as well in terms of how, um, you know, what our messaging is like uh, and how we are engaging with clients and, um, you know, as we're facing uh, economic uncertainty with organizations, um, it's, it's requiring everybody to, to quote Dr. Stop or Pivot uh, in terms of how they are um, positioning themselves in the marketplace and, and engaging with prospective and existing uh, clients. So um, I think it has a, it, there's not anything that's been untouched by it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and, and as Angela says in the chat, would you consider it an accelerator, COVID an accelerator? Absolutely. I think an accelerator and a proof of concept in some cases, as I spoke about, you know, people have been talking about working from home yeah. since probably baby boomers, you know, got into the workforce. You, know, you have to remember, a lot of us are working with systems and structures and policies and practices that were created over a hundred years ago, like like industrial revolution kind of times were when the the five day work week in the eight to five, can I say nonsense came about? Like, you know, we've we've been meaning, I think, to take a look at these with a thoughtful eye for a very long time. And COVID forced us to do that. And so if you want to look at a silver lining of this horrible, horrible thing that has happened, I think it has pushed some organizations to see that the world has changed. And, and it wasn't just COVID that changed it. And if they weren't ready to change, they were going to get left behind. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if you look at what happened to the stock market, I don't know if you follow the, um, the stock market and the the Robin Hood and the, the Gamefly, is that the name of the company, Gamefly? GameStop. GameStop, thank you. Yes. Um, my goodness, what's happened in the last couple of days, if you would have talked to somebody in the 80s, like one of the big Wall Street kind of, you know, superstars in the 80s, that, that a bunch of very vocal people who were mad or who had an idea could impact the United States stock market, they would have laughed in your face. Yeah. And look what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you. And just another organizational example of COVID. So one of the things that's part of our portfolio and executive education at the McCourt School are, are uh, open enrollment programs, workshops on um, a variety of topics, most of which are policy related, but some are more sort of um, uh, soft skills. Um, and that has an op created an opportunity for us to launch a couple of new workshops um, around, ones around influencing virtually. Um, mm -hmm. So how can you, you know, sort of leverage yourself in a way that, um, that um, uh, helps you get what you want um, in a virtual environment. And this is done by one of our faculty members that teaches a course on negotiation. Um, so as we're looking at how does that, you know, how to, how do you have those kinds of, of uh, negotiating um, uh, types of exchanges over Zoom? It's not the same as an in-person 
or even um, over the phone. Uh, so we found an opportunity to create uh, a new uh, course offering. We're also offering a course on um, uh, effective online meetings and facilitating effective online meetings. And that has really hit a, hit a nerve and we've gotten some um, good responses to that. And those are both coming up uh, later this spring. So uh, for better or for worse, it's created a, another little, you know, um, sort of uh, market opportunity for, for us. Um, and I think that that's sort of a little isolated example of, of how COVID is impacting uh, organizations uh, like ours. Uh, thank you. So I think we have time for uh, one last question. Uh, Aura Kuerjao asks, what are the top priority items in terms of the trends that you discussed today? Well, from my perspective, as I think we said, like the, the, they're not ranked. Um, the ones that we we shared, and I think uh, I think they're going to be um, uh, it's going to be dependent on what kind of organization that you're in and what kind of resources you have at your disposal to figure out which ones um, which of those trends uh, are sort of more strategically important to you than than others. Dr. Topper, I don't know if you have. No, I agree 100. percent You know, we we kind of did a big broad brush on here. But you need to think strategically about your clients, about your client profile, about the people you want to work with, about the work that you do, and and think about how these these can impact you. You know, I think the the world has changed because of COVID and, and other things in a way that that I think you know we talked about. It's not going to go back to the way it was, and that's probably a good thing. You know, I think diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is going to continue to be hugely important. I think being authentic is going to be hugely important. I think having that, that, that brand of, of who you are and what you do and, and being a partner to your clients is going to be hugely important. Um, and then, you know, you need to talk to your clients and you need to talk to yourself and your team and, and figure out what's important and strategic for you. So I think all of these can, can impact in, in a way, but definitely, you know, using this as a starting point versus an ending point will probably make the most value for you spending this hour with us today. Thank you. That is all for the Q&A. Jenny? Yeah, it's time for closing. I would like to thank Dr. Dolan and Dr. Stopper for sharing knowledge, expertise, and wisdom with us today. If we didn't get to your question, please feel free to send us an email or you can reach out to the presenters directly via email. Uh, on behalf of our ODC program, we hope you found this webinar helpful. We would like to hear your feedback on our webinar series. So are there topics you would recommend for future webinars? Do you want to provide your opinions about the presenters or our webinar team? If so, please take the survey using the link in the chat box. If you cannot get the link, we will send it to you via email. Our next webinar is about the benefits of a project management change management collaboration by Dr. Susan Cromwell on February 26th, Friday at the same time today. Registrations for all events can be found on all of our social media platforms. Thank you all for attending today and see you in the next webinar. Again, thank you for Dr. Dolan and Dr. Stopper. Yeah, thank you all for your attention and interest. You know, this course is a passion project for both Dr. Dolan and me. You know, the, the products of our ODNC program, we're products of this ODNC program. We're pleased to be able to join you and share some additional insights and continue the conversation around marketing organization development. You know, we encourage you to connect with us on LinkedIn so we can kind of keep the conversation going. So thank you all for your time. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone, have a great day.